and bless us all with his pearls of wisdom. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, ladies and gentlemen. Respected, my dear friend, Deputy Chief Minister Marve, and Deputy Chief Minister, since many years we know, uh, as a politician, sometimes newspaper usually carries some different views. <laughs> Then, the elder brothers and sisters, and I think most of you, I think younger brothers and younger sisters. I really feel a meaningful sort of meeting, and I feel great honor. You invited me here. And then first day, I want to also the, express the appreciation you've done. Oh, really make, I think, serious effort. So I really appreciate. And you mentioned the existing Indian modern education introduced by Britisher. Uh, at that time, I also, you see, same view, same feeling. At that time, I think Indian, as a traditional sort of educated people, scholars, I think should involve uh, India, not one European country. This country, as you mentioned rightly, three, four, five thousand years already, you see, you have a uh, certain sort of education or knowledge. So it is quite a pity when uh, modern education introduced here, I think, should combine with ancient Indian knowledge. <clears throat> so now you, as I mentioned that, I really uh, very much sort of impressed. Now because I myself, as a student of ancient Indian thought, In 8th century, I think firstly, I think 7th century, Tibetan emperor, in spite of very close relations with Chinese emperor through marriage, but he preferred Tibetan script at that time improve or uh, uh, newly sort of developed. And in a way, you see, he copy uh, Devanagari, one ancient Indian script. So our Tibetan sort of script, alphabet, Kakakanga, Chajahanya, like that. And then, uh, then 8th century, Tibetan emperor, I think his mother also was one Chinese so it was the uh, princess. Uh, and China already is very much, Buddha Dharma very much flourished already in China. But then he preferred, you see, the proper teacher of Buddha Dharma should come from India. So he invited the 8th century. At that time, Nalanda Institution, so also they because of the highly. Oh, so at that time, 
I think almost the best scholar, a monk, and also, I mean, scholar in the field of philosophy. Madhimika philosophy, as well as Chitta Mantra philosophy, Shandarakshita, great scholar. We can, we can see uh, through his writing oh, how much that person knowledgeable. Then he also great logician. So his writing about logic there. One of our texts to study. And then his student Kamala Shila. Both of them you see they invited to Tibet by Tibetan Emperor. Then these people introduce Buddha Dharma according to Nalanda tradition. So now today, it seems now the Nalanda tradition, more complete form, I think exists only in, Tibet, in Tibetan sort of, or say the monastic institution. So we usually, you see, study these texts over 20, 30 years. I myself also used to study, study these texts. When I carry study, I was quite reluctant, lazy student, not much interest for study. <laughs> But those subjects which I learned with great reluctance, eventually I found ah, very, very useful, this knowledge. So the, all this knowledge, uh, firstly, I think the Madhimika philosophy give us the wider perspective and reach deeper level of reality. Wonderful. I think uh, the very destructive emotion, very much based on appearances. So the knowledge, the deeper reality, like quantum physics, very helpful to tackle our destructive emotion. Then the way, you see, to approach these things, we use extensively logical approach. Buddha himself, you see, told, told us, you should not accept my teaching out of faith, out of devotion, but rather thorough investigation. So some of his followers, like Nagarjuna, Chandakirti, and they, even you see, some Buddha's own teaching, teaching which give uh, certain sort of audience. So, according to that sort of uh, mental disposition, Buddha taught certain sort of uh, certain concept. So that, then later Nagarjuna and these people rejected Buddha's own sort of uh, text, text over teaching, sutra. If you accept this Buddha's teaching literally, it goes against reason. Therefore, we must reject. It's quite unique. So, this master, you see, taught us the logical approach. Everything. Investigate and experiment. So, therefore, the, uh, the according to Nalinda tradition, uh, these Buddhist masters, they said they are, since they very much emphasis on reason, experiment, therefore, our thinking, very scientific way. So last over 30 years, I have serious discussion with modern scientists. As a result, now it become very clear, meeting with scientists, mainly cosmology, four fields, cosmology, 
neurobiology, uh, physics, particularly uh, quantum physics, then psychology. It's very useful, mutual learning. So all these knowledge come from Nalanda. Before, one, one great Tibetan, or say the uh, spiritual leaders, as well as great scholar, he expressed, till light of India reached Tibet, Tibet, in spite land of snow, still dark. Only after India's light reached there, then Tibet became bright. It's quite true. So I always see it uh, expressing. Traditionally, histor historically, we are chela of Indian guru. And also, you see, I usually see telling, we are not only chela, but quite reliable, trusted chela. <laughs> Truly. So over a thousand years, Look, in India itself, like Nalanda, ruined, nothing there. Uh, but all this knowledge we kept over a thousand years. So now, in, now is my main point is, as a now uh, nearly 83-year-old person, I have a lot of sort of uh, meeting with different people and watching the world, then, a lot of trouble. Many of these trouble, besides nature disaster, many of them are on creation. According to scientists, basic human nature is more compassionate. Yet, we created a lot of problems through anger, hatred, jealousy, suspicion. So now, the modern education, nothing to offer regarding inner peace. Because modern education very much oriented about material value. So, you see, the, every country, humanity, through modern education, then they create materialistic culture, materialistic life. So external values, very difficult to bring inner peace. So therefore, now, I always is telling everywhere, now just uh, materialistic education is not sufficient. Now, we should look for uh, our uh, inner value. These days, I describe the hygiene of physical in our education, the in education, hygiene, hygiene of physical there. Good. Now, we need Hygiene of emotion in our education, very important. Healthy physical, but mentally much disturbed mind, and then the healthy physical sometimes you see create more trouble. <laughs> so the healthy physical, similarly, same time, is a healthy mind, then very good. So now, I think the whole world need some kind of moral ethics, education about moral ethics, not based on religion, but based on our common sense and uh, scientific finding. So when I ca carry this message with conviction, then look India. over 3,000 years, education about our mind already there. So, they, in order to tackle, tackle our emotion, 
this country developed practice of shamatha, practice of vipassana. Before Buddha come, already exist the practice of shamatha, practice of vipassana. So Buddha himself product of ancient Indian culture. So, so now I really feel only this country, India, have the ability to combine modern education and ancient Indian knowledge. Combine modern education, let's say, very helpful to material development. We need material development. Uh, and then ancient Indian education or knowledge about our inner world, our emotion, how to tackle our emotion. Thousand years in this country, the concept of ahimsa there. Ahimsa and karuna combined. Without karuna, ahimsa, uh, not possible. So, uh, with that concept, uh, this country, over a thousand years, religious harmony in there. According to Indian sort of understanding, secular means respect all religion and also respect non-believer. It is very practical and very wise. So the secular ethics, uh, you see, they carried in this country. So now today, India, over one billion population, there are some problems. Uh, uh, but in spite of that, and then East India, South India, West India, North India, Central India, different language, different script, but live harmoniously together. And different religious tradition. Like Sangha philosophy, Jain philosophy, and through Sangha philosophy, there are many different sort of Hindu tradition, and then Jain tradition, then Buddhist tradition, then later uh, the Sikhism. <laughs> when I begin to mention Sikhism, you yawning. <laughs> the Guru Nanak, I think Hindu background, he deliberately take pilgrimage to Mecca to show religious harmony. Wonderful. These are homegrown different, different spiritual tradition. Then from outside, ancient time, Zorazuddin from Parsia. Uh, now in Bombay, uh, less than 100,000 small population. But live very happily. No fear. Very small population in among, say, the millions of Christian, millions of Muslim, Hindus, the small Zorazotin, Parsi, I mean, Parsi people there. That's India. I think religious harmony is truly marvelous because of India's thousand year old tradition of ahimsa and secular and karuna. So now, unfortunately, modern India, I think much neglected about ancient Indian knowledge. So now you are now showing interest and not only interest making effort. So I want to express my congratulation. Wonderful. Now combination modern education and ancient Indian knowledge combined. Then uh, I think physical, physical level, well, mental level, peace, compassionate. So compassion is very important because the very purpose of our life, I usually describe happiness. Reason, the future, 
even this afternoon, what will happen? Do not know. In future, no guarantee. But our life uh, based on hope. Even present some difficulties, still with hope, our life remains. If someone completely lost hope, then that very mental attitude shortened their life. And worst case, even suicide may take place. So therefore, hope means something good. Therefore, the purpose of our life, I usually telling people, happiness is our sort of the real meaning of our life. Now happiness, the materialistic way, happiness only sensory level. Seeing something nice, hearing some beautiful music, and taste, and smell, and touch, including sex. These are materialistic sort of, or say the happiness, materialistic level happiness. These are short, not long-lasting happiness. Long-lasting happiness must develop on mental level. Even, you see, faith, not sensory level, mental level. So faith brings inner peace. Now in this country, Sangha philosophy, Jain philosophy, uh, one part of Sangha philosophy, and then Jain philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, no creator, rather self-creation. So therefore, uh, the concept of karma also come. Everything depends on your own action, positive action, uh, virtuous action bring good, harmful, sinful action bring uh, suffering. That depends on motivation. So in this country, over 3,000 years, our uh, city already examined the ultimate source of happiness, not external, but here. Not sensorial level, but mental level. So practice of shamatha, practice of vipassana, come. So therefore, uh, and you see these things originally come from religious text. Now we should take now these things as an academic subject, not a religious subject. Faith is something different. So similarly, a lot of Buddhist text, there's a lot of sort of explanation, uh, logic, and philosophy. The original source, religious text. But we should take this as an academic subject so that millions of Hindus, millions of Christians, Islam, you see, can learn psychology and, and logic, you see, remain your own faith. But meantime, these things considered as an academic subject and, sh and I think worthwhile to study, to learn. So, so now, whole world facing some problem due to very unrest emotion, the emotional crisis now really you know, taking place on our, because of the, in this world. So in that case, ancient Indian knowledge, the way to tackle our emotion is very, very relevant. Not only ancient sort of knowledge, but relevant, re very, very relevant to today's world. So not, you see, these not carried by uh, temples or ritual or kasoda ka or prayer. No, through education, through education, and strictly secular way. So once this country 
you see, develop more complete form of education, taking care physical, similarly taking care our emotion, our mind. Then I have no doubt. I think Chinese historically, Buddhist Buddhist country, wherever Chinese sort of community there, some Buddhist temple, like Vietnamese, always there. So they also, I think. Uh, pay more attention about the education field, education about modern education, plus uh, education about uh, how to build inner peace, how to tackle destructive emotion, strictly secular way. So I think revival of ancient Indian knowledge, firstly in this country, then other Buddhist countries certainly. I think Kazoda uh, uh, will uh, will take some sort of experience from India, and then China. And if China, India, both, you see, they pay more attention about inner value through education, then combine these two nations uh, over two, two and a half billions of human beings. So very important. Now, Delhi, a capital of Indian Republic. Now you start some sort of effort. So I feel uh, very, very useful. Uh, and so, as I mentioned earlier, we. Traditionally, chela of Indian guru. Now, modern time. Now it seems now, traditional Indian guru's chela now become guru. <laughs> traditional our guru, not much knowledge these things. <laughs> so, uh, so India introduced these things. Combine modern education and ancient Indian knowledge. Combine, then you truly become a modern guru. And other country becoming modern chela. <laughs> so that was I want to share with you. So now here, uh, most of them teacher. These, huh? huh? So these sort of uh, knowledge. Firstly, you, as a teacher, you yourself sort of think more seriously. Then, uh, and also you see, combined with modern scientific finding, then you can teach children. Not just say, oh, this book. Mention that, and this book mentioned that. Not that way. Use common sense and the scientific finding. Then it becomes real sort of interest and conviction. So I usually describe myself half Buddhist monk, half scientist. So it can grow. Those tradition, not just based on faith, but through sort of. Or the vipassana investigation, that's very scientific. So, I think through education, this country, firstly, this country, you see, can make some kind of the new revolution, sort of revolution in education field here. Then, it affects large number of Asian countries, then also European countries, or South and North America. So therefore, uh, you see, your work really, I think, eventually can be benefit to entire humanity. Thank you.